We may thank Ron Morris, tonight's speaker, for the illuminating exhibit in the Architecture Building Gallery. Sponsored by the Cummins Engine Company of Columbus, Indiana, the architectural exhibit was initially conceived and put together to pay tribute to Mr. Irwin Miller's contribution to the general quality of life in Columbus and in particular to the architectural quality of life in Columbus and to celebrate Columbus's rather rare collection of modern buildings. The exhibit consists of some original concept studies, some original sketches, many original extremely well-crafted uh, models, and many actual photographs of the buildings, the major, some of the major buildings in Columbus. Mr. Morris collaborated on the creation of the exhibit that you see tonight, whose first showing was at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. in 1986. For that exhibit, Mr. Morris was responsible for procuring many of the original documents, finding drawings, photos, um, reassembling uh, models that we see here tonight in the architecture building. Also for the Washington display, uh, Mr. Morris coordinated all of the major aspects of production. Ron Morris was educated as an architect at the University of Cincinnati, and he has been associated with the Cummins Engine Company of Columbus for 12 years as a registered architect. At Cummins, he has been responsible for many design and construction projects, and presently as manager of architectural design for worldwide corporate facilities. Mr. Morris has also been extremely cooperative in the arrangements for tours of Columbus undertaken by faculty and students of the College of Architecture and Planning here at Ball State University. As the self-created archivist of the architecture of Columbus, Indiana, and as a friend of the College of Architecture and Planning, as a friend of the Department of Architecture at Ball State, I welcome Ron Morris. Want to be mic'd? Yes. First one. Thanks for that uh, glowing introduction. That's really great. I want to wish you uh, all a good evening. I understand that uh, some of you may run out here very shortly because the Ball State team is returning from their season at 8.30 or so. So we'll try to get through this so you'll have a chance to go out and see the team and welcome the team back. They certainly did a wonderful job in representing Ball State. And I think uh, if you look at sports and you look at the kinds of things that sports do bring to a, a university, and that's the kinds of things that makes the university familiar with other people in other parts of the country. And I think uh, I've read many things about people saying, who's Ball State? Well, they certainly know who Ball State is uh, right now. It's interesting because I'm an Indiana person myself. Um, went to high school in Lebanon, Indiana. Um, at that time, there was not a uh, art school of architecture at uh, Ball State. Matter of fact, it was still Ball State Teachers College at the time. And after a few years, uh, I, I did go to a junior college and then uh, eventually got down to the University of Cincinnati. Um, it was a little bit different uh, way of education through the co-op system, and uh, it, uh, it was great, and I really enjoyed it. And I know you all, uh, the many architectural and design students here, are probably enjoying your 24-hour um, school sessions that you have here in, in the School of Architecture. Well, I want to get started. Um, I'm sure many of you heard, have heard about Columbus architecture, and I know many of you have read about Columbus architecture. And I, I know I'm really kind of speaking to a captive audience here because I'm sure Columbus architecture has really been played up uh, quite a bit here in the School of Architecture. And I know many of you have, have visited Columbus and been able to experience Columbus architecture. And certainly some of you live there. I know there's some Columbus people that are probably here tonight that live in the Columbus area and probably were raised there and uh, been able to experience some of the neat things and the side effects of the quality of the Columbus architecture. But really, what's Columbus architecture all about? Why did Columbus architecture happen? Was there really a grand scheme? We've all heard about Athens and the Prairie. Was there a grand scheme to create an Athens and the Prairie in Columbus? 
really what does quality and excellence have to do with life in a small town or really any place, any size town? What does it really have to do with life in that town? Who was responsible for all this uh, Columbus architecture? Was there only one individual, individual who was uh, responsible and influential in this whole development of Columbus architecture? Really, how's a community been involved in all this? And I think a question that we'd all have to ask, has Columbus architecture been successful? What's been in, uh, the impact on the people who live there? I've raised my four sons in the Columbus area from very early in life. And uh, what's been in the impact on their life? How do the buildings rate today? What can you go in and find out about the buildings and how do they rate? Is Columbus architecture alive and well today? And probably more importantly, will it be alive and well tomorrow? Now, over the years, many grand observations have been made about Columbus and uh, its, obser uh, its uh, Columbus architecture, observations and opinions and analysis. And just in the first six months of this year, there has been four major, there will be four major publications producing articles on Columbus. Architectural Record had one in January. Uh, Interiors Magazine will have one in the very near future. So there's been a lot written about Columbus. Now I think all these could have been an interesting topics to uh, further research and analyze and maybe share some profound statement with you tonight. But I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. What I found has been extremely interesting to find that you can read about architecture in Columbus, and I think that's really good. And you can visit Columbus and experience the architecture in, in a live workshop, actually go there and experience the architecture, and certainly that's even better. Read about it, that's good. Experience, and that's even better. But what I've discovered has been not much gathered about the design process of the Columbus architecture and really how that process impacted the final design. Really, what happened between the program and the actual building? Really, what happened in between there? You go just from an initial contact to a final building. Those are all important. Those are important steps. But there are many things that happen in between. That's the important thing to architects, I believe. As designers, and particularly students of architectural design, I know you're being asked all the time, why did you do that? What does all this mean? How did you arrive at this solution? Really, what's the concept? What led you to this final great scheme that you came up with? So I'm going to be talking a little bit tonight about the reference of Columbus architecture to what I refer to as a missing link of Columbus architecture. That, that's the process that leads to the final design. One can read about Columbus, and certainly that's good. One can visit Columbus, and certainly that's even better. But how can we go back in time and under, understand what impacted the final design? Now, I hope you won't be too awfully disappointed. I'm not really here to make any profound uh, statement about Columbus architecture. Many people have done that, certainly could do uh, that again. I'm really interested in something a little bit different about Columbus architecture. And I find myself in a unique position as an architect, being able to introduce some observations that I've made about the missing link of Columbus architecture and really what's being done about it. My part in this has been a collector and a keeper of, of these various things that you see on display out here. There's models and drawings, and I've been also receiving some written information, some documentation, some programs, some uh, facts and figures about uh, meetings that went on. I've even been given some videos, and just recently I was given a film that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, all this development is being done in conjunction with three organizations in the Columbus area. Columbus Visitor Center, who has been a strong supporter and leader of, of uh, the Columbus architectural environment in, in our city. Bartholomew County Library, who has, who, who has and continues to create the archives uh, space and the dedication to creating an archive of Columbus architecture. 
and certainly in conjunction with Cummins Engine Company because that's who I work for, and, who, who, and they allow me to do these kinds of things. I mentioned I received uh, videos and films. I think it's very interesting because there's many people in Columbus who really are, are in tune to the architecture in Columbus. Uh, I think it's they're in tune to the quality that this architecture has been able to affect the community with and how the people are affected by this. Many strong supporters, and certainly some people who are distractors, but many strong supporters. Just several days ago, uh, a lady came up and said, I have just discovered, I'm getting a little ringing there, it's okay. I've just discovered a film of Saarinen uh, on the construction site of the first Christian ch church. And I'm wondering if you might be able to use that. And I said, well, certainly I want to take that into the archives and, and take a look at that. I've not had a chance to look at it yet. But I think many very interesting things can be taken from that film and applied to the design process, to that missing link. Some of the things that Saarinen did uh, on the job site, hopefully some things will come out of why certain things were done. The first Christian church, you say, well, what does that mean? That dates to 1930, the late 1930s, I should say. So that's history gone by. It's in film. We've captured it. Something that should become part of the archives. So this becomes a continuing effort on my part to be able to bring these things together. Again, these things that are missing link of Columbus architecture. Again, I want to emphasize that my part is really to collect and store and present these uh, pieces of Columbus architecture. And I'm doing this over and above my responsibility at Cummins. And you say, well, why are you doing that? Well, I have a strong desire to be a part of Columbus architectural scene. I think it's interesting to be able to look at the quality things that have been done and to take a little bit different approach about the design process, because I think that's interesting. I know as a student and as a practicing architect, I knew that was important to the client to be able to understand the process. But it made it very much easier if you could go in with logical steps and show the client what the final result of the project was and how you arrived at that project. So that's been the area of interest that I have kind of tried to develop. Now, a little bit later on, I will have uh, Kevin Roach, in a video presentation, give to you a process, a design process, or a missing link on the, one of Cummins' buildings. I'm sure some of the professors that are in attendance tonight have, has probably seen that video. It's an outstanding process film that Kevin did for us, and it answers many questions why certain things were done on a particular building. I think that's really quite interesting. Now, I think most of you have been through the Columbus Architectural Display and probably had an overview as you went through. Now, you need to go back and look at it a little bit more carefully because there are a few things pointed out there. For example, uh, Tingley's uh, study model for chaos, which is the kinetic sculpture that uh, was built in Commons. It's a study model of that actual uh, chaos sculpture that uh, was actually presented there. That dates back to 1973. Uh, Venturi has, uh, we have elevation drawings of fire station number four, some playful approaches to the things that he was looking at and trying to do with, with firehouse number four. That dates back to 1967. Uh, then Elliot Noyes, uh, there are some uh, sketches for Southside School, some of the things that he had. If you look at that very carefully, they are very sketchy, uh, some very playful things done with rooftop mechanical units. So he was looking at some things that he might be able to do in that whole presentation. That dates back to 1969. And then there's a study model for First Christian Church, a study model of a design that was not done. But that dates back to 1937. There's two city plan uh, models, uh, one that I.M. Pei did in a very small area surrounding his library that he did in 1969. And then we had SOM come to the city in 1964, and they did a complete downtown master plan dating to 1964, as I said. Now, these two plans became guidelines 
They're not something that was done just for fun. They were actually done to give some kind of a, a organization to the downtown development, even in a small town. Columbus is a, a small community of 35,000. It's important to have a plan. And even though these date back to uh, the, to the uh, late and mid-60s, these became important to the downtown development. You say, well, why or how can you give an example of that? Just recently, the late Paul Kinnon, CRSS, was commissioned to do some work in the downtown area. <clears throat> and following that 64 uh, SOM plan, he continued along with the streetscape development of the downtown, taking the uh, Washington Street where the development of the storefronts and the old style of uh, the Columbus architecture uh, was recognized and has been kept up over the years. Paul, Paul was able to take that and continue that development along a streetscape development. That'll continue from probably 2nd Street up to 8th Street. I believe right as we almost speak, they're out for bids on one of the corners at 5th Street. So those kinds of things are going on. I mentioned uh, with some of the professors tonight that Elio Ambaz has been retained and commissioned to design the new approach bridge to Columbus. Now that also follows the downtown master plan. There was always the thought of another bridge, a second bridge coming into Columbus. So those are the kinds of things that are going on currently, as you see from the guidelines that are on display tonight. What we hope to do is to capture the current projects, get a little bit more up to speed on the things that are going on, and be able to bring those kinds of things into the archives. Now, what I want to do just for a minute before I go on is I want to thank, express my gratitude and thank uh, all the people that have been so good to me here at the Ball State University. Um, Jack Wyman, of course, who asked me to come here some months ago, uh, thought I might have some in interesting observations that I could share with you and the faculty, and I hope I'll be able to do that tonight. You were a caller, Kohler who believed that the Columbus architectural display could make a strong impact. And I think that you'll see that it does make a strong impact on how do good design in the community can, can affect the quality of the environment of the community. Certainly had a lot of students. I hope some of you saw when we brought the truck in the mammoth uh, boxes that we had uh, with all the display uh, models and pedestals and so forth uh, stored in them. Uh, I'm going to mention some names, and I'll probably forget someone, so I'll apologize. But uh, special thanks to those students who helped, uh, Mike and Ken and Lou and Diane and Jill. They were all just really great and got in there and, and uh, worked very hard. Um, Pat, video set up. Is he here somewhere? OK. Thanks to you for helping uh, set up the video. Appreciate that. Uh, Bob, I, I can't recall his last name from the wood shop, but he provided all the tools and uh, materials and helped unload the uh, display, which again was very monstrous and really needed, we needed a lot of manpower to do that. And then I can't uh, help but to give some special thanks to Tony Costello and Pedro. I saw Pedro out there somewhere. Uh, they just were great. They helped me from the, the day the truck arrived on site. I think we were here about three days, pretty close to three days, all the way through unloading and uh, positioning the models and hanging the pictures and cleaning the models and the final leveling of all of them. They were just great, and I really appreciate it. Okay, to continue on, really, what is the missing link? And why is it important? And how did this interest begin? And what's really being done about the missing link? And what remains to be done? Now, there's been a real keen interest in Columbus over the years to do something like this, to create an archives for Columbus architecture. And certainly, many architects have been a part of that. And they've contributed many things, as you'll see out here tonight, many things to that archives and to that display. And many Columbus residents have worked on it. And a lot of people have devoted a lot of time to it. My involvement began, began in 1986 when the National Building Museum was going to put together a display that they wanted to bring up to Washington Street, Washington, D.C. for the National Building Museum. And this display was going to be in conjunction with an award that Mr. Miller was going to be given in 1986. 
And of course, this was an honor, Mr. Miller, for his uh, continuing uh, support and encouragement of architecture in Columbus. Now, I want to quote to you that Mr. Miller really believes in something. And I don't like to emphasize Mr. Miller a great amount. But again, you have to have someone who sets the pace for all this. And this, this is for what Mr. Miller has done for the community. What you see in many cases in the Columbus area and the display that you'll see here tonight is the community involvement, the people working to create these things. Yes, you have to have someone to start the ball rolling, and this is what Mr. Miller has done. He believes that good architecture will provide a beneficial effect on the, the people, their lives, that the architecture serves. And I believe that's probably, there's been many uh, quotes about Mr. Miller, and I think that's probably uh, captures, captured, captures it all. I was fortunate to be asked to assist uh, in the National Building Museum of putting this display together. The former director of the National Building Museum came to Columbus and began to look at the archives and the various pieces and to see what could be done. Now, what his thoughts were is the design sketches the study models. That's what he was looking for. And I guess I kind of scratched my head and said, uh, well, we don't have a lot of those things. And, and uh, people have really not asked for those kinds of things. And we have some finished models. And he said, well, fine, let me see some of the finished models. And uh, we went looking for some of the finished models, and they were not in very good shape. Um, and uh, so we said, well, some of those look like study models. But that was his idea. Sketches, thumbnail sketches, the kinds of uh, yellow tissue that uh, we work on all the time and we throw away. Those kinds of things, the concept, what led up to something. You'll see tonight that we did find some concept sketches and we've been able to gain some concept sketches. We certainly found some finished renderings and we did find some study models and finished models. I have uh, probably eight or ten study models. Uh, three or four of them are of the commons, the shopping mall downtown. We have basically a finished model, even though it's not quite the way the interior was finished. We have a finished model out there. Uh, several times when I've given this presentation, I've been able to bring these study models in, and they're in just very, very sad shape. Those are the kinds of things that, said, uh, that would say how this development came, why the spline development, why the entryways were placed where they were, why all the glass. Those kinds of things begin to be answered by those models. Certainly, we uh, found many photographs. Belvazar Korab has photographed Columbus many, many times. Absolutely wonderful photographs, and many of them on display are his works. But the National Building Museum was really surprised that they couldn't find more of this concept stuff. So I really got to thinking about that, that we really have all the articles written about Columbus, and I'm sure that many of you have read about Columbus. And as I said, I recited just four publications in the first six months of this year. We have all the great photographs of Columbus. We can certainly come to Columbus and experience the architecture, but what happened in between? I got to thinking, wouldn't this be a great thing to be able to have some area that people could come and look at what the problem the architect was really asked to solve? What was the problem that the architect was uh, asked to solve when he came to do the Columbus Occupational Health Association Center. Is there something special there? I don't know. It would be really nice to know. How was all this information presented? Who were all the players? Very important because a lot of those players should be recorded or we should get some notes from the players to see what's important uh, and how they impacted the final design. Really how the architect and the client interact. What were the solutions that were presented? Certainly very uh, many solutions were presented, not just the final one. What was accepted and why? And what were some of the thoughts and the ideas and directions that led to the final solution as it was built? So this really became what I thought the missing link of Columbus architecture, that, app, that part that happened in between the initial contact and the, uh, the actual solution. So I sat around. Uh, I spent some time with the Bates-Lowry the National Building Museum director. Uh, I think he was here for a half a day, and then I, I went around trying to find some of these things, and I did find some. 
But then I began talking to the architects who, who have uh, done work in Columbus. And I asked them for sketches, study models. Most study models have been destroyed. Um, a lot of the sketches are still available, but the architects are very sometimes reluctant to uh, give up those sketches. So for the display in Washington, I was able to revive, and I say revive because many of the models uh, were in just terribly sad shape. Uh, many of the sketches had to be recalibrated and framed and so forth. We had to build bases and, and uh, pedestals for all the models. But I was able to really come out with about 10 models and 12 original sketches and then a whole variety of photographs. So in 1986, this really became the foundation for the Columbus architecture missing link. Now, when I've taken this show out and through many questions of people coming to Columbus uh, through my involvement with the visitor center, many people will ask, why? And as I began to look at that, I'm curious to know if they're asking why the architectural scene happened. And they are. But I find more and more they're asking why a particular building or a detail or a style or something like that was followed. Really what impacted that? Really what caused it? So as I look through that, to be able to capture and make a part of the archives. So these really become these few sites that I've given to you and hundreds of more, hundreds more become examples of the missing link of Columbus architecture. Now uh, this, this display that you'll see tonight is a tribute to good design in the community and good design in the community. Certainly a tribute to the leadership in Columbus, both public and private, because you have to have people working together. You can't have the bureaucratic uh, problems that a lot of communities have. You have to have people pulling together to make all these things happen. And I don't want to get into, again, the quality aspect, but again, that's what it's all about, is to be able to create that quality environment for people to be able to live in, worship in, and raise their children in. It's also a tribute to the town that dreams because we want to be able to send the town of Columbus out. And we're doing that by this good design in the community display. We want to send that out to communities and have them be able to understand a few things about Columbus through this display. We do get a lot of requests for the display. We don't always send it out. Um, I have a small part of the display in the USSR right now, so there are some other examples going on, other parts of the display out. Now it's also, this display, a part of the missing link of Columbus architecture. We have the finished models, but we have some study models. You can look at the two downtown master plans. Those are study models. We certainly have some finished drawings, but we also have some study drawings, sketch drawings. So really what I'm here to talk about and emphasize is that we in Columbus recognize that uh, we believe there's a need for this archives to be developed into Columbus. And you say, well, why? What's, what's uh, valuable about that? Well, we want the architectural historian and the scholar. We want the architectural student. And we certainly want the person who says why to be able to have a place to go to study those kinds of things, to be able to look into some research and, and uh, pull out some facts and figures about Columbus architecture. I know many of you visit Columbus, and you continue to come back, and it's nice to see the buildings, certainly nice to experience the buildings, but you may start to think it would be nice maybe one time just to go and find out something about a particular building, study the little, a little bit of background about, about the building and how that building really came about. Eventually, we hope to have a place for this archives to be stored and it was interesting tonight, it uh, was mentioned, it's certainly more than an archive. It'd probably be a museum space also. But those kinds of things that we want to do. And as I said, this began in 1986. We're just beginning. There's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot of groups working hard on this. Now, what I want to do is just take about 34 minutes. That's how long this video takes. And I want to share an, you know, one outstanding example of a design process for this missing link that Kevin Roach employed in a program and design process for a Cummins building. 
this building was completed in 1983, the video that you see was created from a film that was shot in 1978 as this whole presentation was being given to our board of directors. Now I have a little bit of a kind of inside story on this whole corporate office building project. Uh, I was part of the uh, initial programming as a project uh, manager and as a design manager. Uh, then during early and late construction, I was manager of construction. And then since I had all that kind of background when it came time to occupy the building in 1983, I was asked to go through the occupancy phase and mature operation phase. So I spent about five years taking the occupancy stage to a mature facility. And uh, so I have some background and interest in this whole corporate office building. And we also did some interesting things. We involved the community in all the design of this building. We actually went to the community leaders. We set up programs and we talked to the community. And I happened to be a part of that. That was very exciting. We also asked our employees. We are, we are big at Cummins Engine Company, very large corporation, 25,000 employees worldwide. We try to involve our people in the layout of their space. So we did go to the people and ask them what they thought they needed to have in their office environment to make their work better, to be able to do things better. I was there when we shared our plans with the shareholders, Cummins Worldwide, and the Columbus community. I really think you'll enjoy this presentation, and I hope you'll understand a little bit about this design process and how that all goes together and why it's important to retain the design process. Now the video, even though it's a brand new video, the quality is not outstanding. I'm not sure exactly the reason. So overlook the quality of the video and start to key in on the presentation that you'll see. That's the important thing, the design process. Okay. Town. And certainly they do that. We get a, a number of people that will eat in, and certainly a number of people that will go out. And it's in the Sirline building. This, the um, interesting thing about the Sirline building is that as we looked at it, it could be left, or could have been left, as, as uh, Kevin proposed, but we started seeing the kinds of things around a cafeteria. We looked at first the cafeteria in the basement. Uh, it just didn't seem very fitting because it wasn't open enough. There wasn't enough outside uh, that could be brought in. So the Saraline building became a perfect place for the cafeteria. Plus, we almost, we almost made a mistake in that building in not thinking in great uh, detail about conference rooms. As most major corporations, we have meetings all the time. And we've just never had enough conference rooms. So as we began to really look at the conference room program, the second, third, and fourth floor of the Saraline building became conference rooms. And we use that, as he suggested, as a conference center. So we have a, just a tremendous amount of conference rooms and uh, in the Saraline building and in the main building. So consequently, it makes it very appropriate for the kinds of things that we do, one of the things that we picked up on. One other thing about the Saraline building I always like to emphasize is that in 1919, when Cummins really was founded, that's where we began. That was our birthplace, that particular building. So it's kind of neat to say our, our building for the 21st century is wrapped around our birthplace, which is the Sirline building. Yes? No. Good question. I, I just don't know how you could probably raise enough interest and raise enough funds to do something like that in a small community. I, you know, if you, if, if you say it would be nice to do, then you have to look at Los Angeles where, you know, they probably have the funds, but people just re really refuse to uh, ride a public transit system and you still have the cars. Everyone wants their own car. Uh, my gosh, I, I can't find a place to park on this campus. I mean, I, I'm probably most of you have your own cars here. so. You know, that's a really a tough problem. It really is. Granted. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they, I... No. Uh, the... 
the whole idea is that Cummins Engine Company certainly is a strong influence in Columbus, Indiana, but to be really successful, you've got to keep a very low profile, and you have to let the private sector grow up and do the kinds of things around development. Um, we've talked about, as I was having dinner tonight, I talked about some of the things that have happened in Columbus. Again, it's an emphasis around the private sector. People have really caught the spirit about the kinds of things that uh, has started in Columbus and they want to carry on. Uh, Cummins Engine Company and Cummins Engine Company Foundation certainly offers that incentive to use the nationally recognized architect, but not everyone uses that program. Uh, it's not open to everyone. The Lutheran Church, which uh, just opened within the past six months, uh, Burkitt's uh, design it was not a foundation-funded uh, program. The church went out on their own and hired Burkitt because they liked what he had done, liked his reputation, and that happens throughout Columbus. Uh, your initial question about housing, uh, uh, that's another interesting thing because there's a community that has grown up outside of Columbus, uh, was kind of thought of as Newtown, and I just read an article saying that they didn't think the development was very good. Well, that's probably right, because still the builders are doing the developing of, of the residential areas, and um, some of them are doing a good job, and most of them are just doing an adequate job. Okay. Yes. I can't hear you. Good question. I think there's been probably three or four new restaurants that have grown up, um, and I think one of them's going out of business. Uh, the Columbus Inn, I think there was a strong desire to create some kind of a motel or hotel space downtown. Um, and when that whole program got started, uh, the old city hall building was sitting vacant and someone had the wonderful idea of converting that into a bed and breakfast, in which it has been. So, yes, that's growing up. Um, we have, yeah, we have a lot of problems in uh, our urban setting, just as other cities do, and we're, we're working hard to, to bring life to the downtown. I, I think the whole key to that is you've got to have people living down there. Uh, we're very fortunate because within just a few blocks of the downtown area, there, there are residential areas, and they are starting to... Uh, people are trying to buy the old houses and, and uh, remodel them and to make that a part of the whole downtown. That's the whole key, is to bring people downtown. Um, the cityscape, which I mentioned, uh, is in the process of going on. Mill Race Park, which is right adjacent to the Cummins property, um, has had a lot of problems over the years. It's, um, it's divided by a state highway. It's hard to get to. It floods and and many, many things. Well, there's been some, some very uh, far uh, thinking about that park, and there's a plan being put together right now, which many, many things are, we're going to try to do in, in, co in cooperation with the 1992 celebration of Columbus, Columbus Day, so, so to speak. And that park is a part of that. So again, encouraging people to come and use a park in the downtown area. Uh, encouraging people to eat in the downtown, to shop in the downtown. There is the shopping mall through the commons. A lot of talk about expanding that shopping mall. It wasn't successful. It's not happened yet. Um, shopping malls continue to grow outside the outskirts of town. Just some of the typical things that we have. We're not perfect. Uh, we work really hard to keep things going that we have. Yes. The foundation has a very unusual program in that it, it offers to a public group, non, not for profit group, uh, to pay the architectural fees of a building. Uh, the only requirement is two requirements, and I say that every time, the only requirement, there's really two requirements. Number one, that you select from a panel of architects that would be offered by the foundation, and you retain that architect for all work on the future on that building. Now, I was also reminded tonight that they, sometimes that, that first selection is not the one that the client would select, so there's another group of architects offered. 
And that's all the requirements of the foundation. Again, they want the people, the clients to be involved in the development. We certainly could be involved and say, we sit on a committee and, and we oversee that. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, and I've been involved in a lot of those, about uh, how the programming is done. And, and sometimes it's, there's, there's some agony around that. Uh, I believe we'll see a little bit more input with the foundation in the future, but still, I think it's completely standoff. Here it is. You take it and develop it as a group with your building committee, and you do it. Yes. I didn't hear the last part. They have never, and they probably will not. Now, you should ask why. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, that's something that uh, should be looked at in the future. I don't represent the foundation. I don't even serve on that board. But uh, I think that would be a neat thing for the foundation to look at sometime. Uh, there's a lot more competition work going on. A lot of commissions are being offered that way, and I think it's something the foundation will probably look at in the future. I just want to say that Ron began the presentation by thanking uh, a lot of people here, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of our knowledge Ron, to thank you for the many, many times you've given us a tour of uh, the common building on very short notice. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.